Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about purines. What the heck are purines? We've talked about it before. It has to do with uric acid, gout, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, cardiovascular disease, but what are purines? I mean, they've been documented since, oh, well, I looked back briefly about 2,700 years ago in, in uh, Egypt. And then of course, under Hippocrates in uh, Greece, and it goes on and on from there. So what is all this? Let's talk about it. So the reason I want to go over this is because it's this thing that most people don't know enough about and they fear it more than they should. And the world has changed a lot. And so I think we need to reframe what we're talking about when we talk about purines. Okay, so I'm calling this, don't let purines be the death of you. Don't let purines be the death of you in terms of you worrying too much about it. You know, what the heck? Um, or, the fact that you have a problem and somebody's pointed out, like your doctor, that oh, you got a problem with purines. You really need to stop all animal products because they're pro purines, you know? He sounded so intelligent, or she sounded so intelligent when she said that. Actually, every living thing, every living cell has purines in it. The issue is having food that is so concentrated of purines. It's concentrated living matter. Hence, we talk about organ meats, as opposed to meats, as opposed to plant-based materials. But some plants are pretty purine, chock full, and therefore have a problem. Because let's get into it. Most people have no idea what a purine is or how it dramatically can affect their life. And it can. But nobody really wants to talk about what consuming too much organ meat can do to you, both good or bad. Or is this not the entire story? So the history of one disease will show how purines are the only necessary ingredient. The only necessary, maybe not sufficient, but the only necessary ingredient. But others, very problematic lifestyle elements, we'll get to them, will make it far, far, far more excruciating experience. All right, the disease is gout, but really is a history of understanding the effects of high uric acid levels and how that has changed over the last 70 years. So this came out in 2020, New York Times, one of the diseases of gluttonous aristocrats, gout, is now tormenting the masses. We must be the masses if they're telling us, right? It can be tempting to ascribe the afflictions of today's prevalence of gout to our current climate of self-indulgence, but it's not the full story. Really not at all. Actually, I don't think it's about indulgence. So in 30 years from 1960s to the 70s, and I'm gonna update this in another slide, the number of sufferers from gout more than doubled in the United States. So that's in 30 years, the rate doubled. It was stable for like the previous 2,700 years, <laughs> and then it doubled in 30 years. Sounds like the stock market, huh? But globally, this is what we're looking at. The United States, surprise, or North America, surprise, it's not the worst offenders or the worst parts have the highest population with gout. That award goes to Taiwan. You probably weren't expecting that. But actually the story is about the native Taiwanese. So the Pacific Islanders, if you will. So the Pacific Islanders that were there before World War II, just like the Okinawans that were there before World War II and before the nationalist movement and so on and so forth, those have the highest rates of gout in the world or the indigenous Taiwanese people. Second to that is New Zealand, but it's not just New Zealanders, it's the Maori Pacific Islanders had the highest rates in New Zealand. So when we're looking at this particular graph, what we're looking at is um, all of New Zealand has kind of diluted, they've added the population that is less affected. Those are the Caucasians from Europe and all the Europeans and for, certainly Australian, but that's still back to Europe. They've diluted the, the high uh, rates, incidence of gout with Maoris. And same with the Taiwanese. You had two different cultures there, so it's not a true reading. It probably would be even far higher. And actually what's representative of the Maori and the indigenous Taiwanese, it's, it's, it's really all the Pacific Islanders. All the Pacific Islanders are very sensitive to the changes over the last hundred years and therefore have the highest rates collectively of gout in the world. So the change is really big for some parts and some cultures in the world. This is another way of looking at it. There's Taiwan, 
and they have men and women. When we're talking about gout, we're just using gout as an example here. We're going to get back to, because that's where purines is usually the topic that comes up with gout. It's and men get gout three times more than women. They have a, a higher uric acid level to start with. And as you get older, the risk or the incidence of gout gets higher as well. But here's Taiwan, USA, New Zealand, UK, Netherlands, etc. And you can see how it goes down. Why should we care? Really, why should we care? Incidence of gouts worldwide, a doubling of worldwide prevalence of gouts from 20 million in 1990 to 41 million. So I just gave you from 1960s to 1990 in the United States, it doubled. And I'm saying from 1990, to 2017, pretty much current date, uh, it has doubled again. So it is zoomingly high, a 4.6 fold difference between the highest regions of the world to the lowest regions of the world. So the highest is, just as I said, Australia, Asia. Uh, that's uh, Australia, New Zealand, really Pacific Islanders, as I just mentioned. And the lowest is Central Latin America. Now, isn't that interesting? Having been to Costa Rica, they have plenty of organ meats and they eat it on a regular basis. Well, wait a minute, what's going on here? So elevated serum uric acid, SUA, hyperuricemia, has been associated with metabolic syndrome. So that's obesity, insulin resistance, and all the things that follow from there. Uh, cardiovascular disease, morbidity, and mortality. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? So elevated serum uric acid levels predicts the onset of type 2 diabetes. So that's why UA is actually, if we're just an endocrinologist if we're, or, and we're just working with a diabetic population or a pre-diabetic population there, hemoglobin A1C is up, a little elevated, and all some of the other biomarkers, UA would be very helpful to both predict and also a marker to work to, to lower. So in diabetic patients, hyperuricemia has been linked to both micro and macro vascular complications. So that means vision for retinopathy, hands and feet, not getting correct circulation, all of that. Those with higher uric acid levels were more likely to get type 2 diabetes. For every one milligram per deciliter, so that's how you measure it is in the, in the United States and North America, and not so much in Europe. So every milligram per deciliter rise, the risk of diabetes goes up by 20%. So if it goes up five points in terms of uric acid, which is a big jump, of course, uh, that would be 100%. But wait a minute, what caused gout 2,500 years ago is different from how we got gout today. The difference is important to know. Both have to do with increases of uric acid. So it's not so much that it existed or didn't exist. It's the incidence in which it existed. It has really gone nuts, like a number of other con chronic uh, conditions. But it has really gone nuts. And this is why we need to look at what are some of the basic things that they knew then that uh, lead to gout, elevated, they didn't know uric acid. That didn't come along for a while. But all that rheumatoid arthritis and all the kind of different kinds of arthritis that they could have, mostly gout, what happened? Where did it come from? And how is it different from then than it is to now? All right, so the basic concept, a gout from high purine foods, right? There's the bad guy, purine foods. And we'll get into what exactly that is. The kidneys are unable to remove the excess uric acid that's formed from you eating all the wrong foods. And gout causes a buildup of uric acid, primarily that is in your big toe. That's called your first metatarsal. And that was exactly how it was 2,500, 2,700 years ago. It was the first metatarsal. So is it really that simple? Don't eat game meats in this particular case, red meats and liver. Don't have high fructose corn syrup. You know, don't have shellfish, shrimp, and anchovies. And don't have beer and alcohol. That's it, eh? Oh, wait a minute. Let's, let's add a couple things that we talked about before. A high omega-6 and a low omega-3, and a high vitamin A through liver consumptions and all the other places you get vitamin A. So that was covered on another uh, video to go to elaborate, which I'm not gonna elaborate on this time too much. Okay, let's go deeper though. So these are purines, and here I'm not trying to blind you and say, oh, now you need to know some biochemistry and some molecular structure. I am pointing out how similar both the cure and the causes are. So look at just the structure. If anything else, you got a hexagon and you have a pentagon tied together. That's all I want you to know. Now look at all the variations. You put those two rings together, double bonded oxygen. Those two rings together, add another double bonded oxygen. Those two rings together, add a nitrogen group. Those two rings together, single 
double bonded oxygen in a different place. That's it. This is the complete list of purines. There's four. They are the breakdown products of RNA and DNA, and there's four. And your body also makes them, obviously. But look at this. It's pretty similar to caffeine. What does caffeine has? Same two rings, two double bond oxygen, methyl group, two methyl, three methyl groups. There you go. What about theobromine, which you get from chocolate? That's the high you get from chocolate. One of the highs you get from chocolate. Theobromine. So, the same two rings, two double bond oxygens, and two methyl groups, just not three like caffeine has. What about theophylline? So, theophylline comes from, uh, I can't remember where it comes from, but it's used actually as a bronchodilator. It is used to treat asthma and emphysema. So, those who can't breathe, how do you break, break open? How do you open your, your ability to breathe? How do you dilate your bronchi. Well, this is what that is. Theophylline is what it's used. So these three are very similar. Now, what does theophylline has? It has two double bonds, oxygen. It has a methyl group, a methyl group, pretty similar to theobromine, just different locations. And so it goes. So just notice how similar that is. Now let's go to, look at this. Look how similar it is to uric acid. It's the same two rings, double bonded oxygen, another double bonded uh, whatever over there. And this is allopurinol. So why would you care about allopurinol? Allopurinol is considered like one of the two main medications that are used today. And the people who discovered this, made this happen in the lab, were given the 1988 Nobel Prize uh, for their work in developing allopurinol. This sort of lowers the production of uric acid. Notice these things, they're all the same thing. You know, if you woke up and you go, what? This is allopurinol, it's just the two rings with hardly anything but an OH group. Hydroxyl group is what they call that. Okay, so the problem, it's not about the purines specifically, but it's about the concentration of purines in the foods you're consuming. So say, in other words, you can't pig out on purines. Some people are pre predisposed to problems and others are not, but that's less of an issue really. I'll We'll get to that in a little bit. So plants have less dense cellular structure, i.e. fewer purines than animals have. And organ meats ha are the most concentrated amount of purines. But purines and if you want to say foods that you shouldn't have, if you actually had uh, gout and so on, there's some plants you shouldn't have, some plant foods. Certainly they'll say, hey, don't do any animal products for the most part. And it gets very specific and we'll get into that. And certainly don't do high purine foods. What I'm saying, and I'm leading you into, it's other factors that have amplified the bad response, have amplified the excruciating painfulness of having elevated uric acid, not just in gouts, but they've elevated the, the rates of dementia. They've elevated the rates of Alzheimer's. They've elevated the rates of metabolic, you know, that metabolic syndrome and the rates of cardiovascular. It's the other things in combination with what was diagnosed 2,700 years ago in Egypt and Hippocrates. Hippocrates called it the unwalkable disease. You just couldn't walk. Okay, the list of foods that have the highest purine concentration. So it's the highest food concentration. Organ meats. These include liver, tripe, which is stomach, sweet bread, which is thymus, brains, kidneys. Okay, game meats, specialities such as goose, veal, venison, are among the reasons why uh, gout was known in the Middle Ages as rich man's disease. So they had their hunting clubs and they all went out hunting with the foxes and everything else and only the wealthy would do that. So that's why they associated with that. Um, and we'll look at that a little more closely. Certain seafoods including herring, scallops, mussels, codfish, tuna, trout, haddock, shrimp, and anchovies. Notice a trout, only freshwater example here. Red meats including beef, lamb, pork, and bacon. So what red meat is not in there? Goat's not in there. And um, don't know of any others. Turkey. This is a leaner meat. Nonetheless, it's higher in purines, especially avoid processed deli turkey. Gravy and meat sauces are high. They all are the drippings of animal products, of course. Yeast and yeast extracts. Okay, organ meats. These are the emetic glands. Liver, I like mine, is pate. Uh, there's kidney, there's tripe. Uh, and this is thymus, sweet bread. And that's hard. I mean, people actually do have these things. Not many. I mean, mostly, I love my liver. I really love my liver. And uh, for me, I have too much, and I do have to sort of not have all that I want to have. Okay, this is now a list. I'm going to give you a number of lists to give you an orientation of what purines are and where they are. According to this, and I can't remember where I got this, this is a, 
the high purine list. And it's very incomplete and it leaves things out. So it puts anchovies, this is all per 100 grams, which is a little over three ounces, uh, three and a half ounces, there you go. And it puts anchovies at the top of the list. Anchovies, sardines, herring, sardines fresh. Notice that they're all seafood, kidney, uh, pork kidneys, anchovies again, canned, uh, pork liver, salmon, fresh, that's interesting, mackerel, and notice it wasn't on the other list, mackerel, liver, chicken liver, redfish, uh, ocean perch, chicken hearts, etc. Okay, now let's go to, this is a, a pretty intense, I forgot to put up the uh, reference here, but this is a pretty intense way of looking at purines. What they did is that this, these are your purines, I put this up, right? So this is guanine, adenine, um, xanthine and hypoxanthine. And on the bottoms, they have these little initials here. So that's adenine, guanine, hypoxanthine, xanthine. And this is the total of all of them. So what they did is they looked at samples of all sorts of foods and they put it through a high pressure liquid chromatography. So they were very exact. They weren't, you know, mucking around here. This is really exact. And they broke it down. And there's a list and list and list. And I called out a few. Okay. So in terms of poultry, the highest, which is red. So it's a, a heat map. So the highest are in red. So what are the highest? Goose liver, otherwise known as foie gras. A duck liver, notice the liver thing. And then as you back, back down from there, the next one is chicken liver. So you got goose liver, duck liver, chicken liver. And that's all poultry. Notice the liver, it's an organ meat of the, of the animal, obviously. What about in livestock, meaning animal? So the highest was pork liver. And the second highest was beef liver. So there you go. So liver is very high, higher than on kidneys, but uh, in terms of organ meat. So you can almost say that organ meat is liver. It's more than that, as I showed you. Okay, what about processed meat products? What's the highest? The highest, in, and by the way, the highest in processed meats, which is prosciutto, we love prosciutto, it's a lot lower than the animal and the, uh, the uh, livestock, we'll say here, and the poultry. Uh, dairy and eggs. So what's the highest there? Now we're talking about almost nothing. We have 12 versus 400. So it's hardly worth mentioning. So dairy and eggs, and they dairy is actually one of the things they recommend should you have gout. Okay, so now you have that list, but this is how they line that up. So that's an exact list, and it's liver. So just assume liver is the highest. That doesn't mean it's bad, by the way. Okay, concentrations of purine in seafood. Again, we just go to the reds. This is a uh, fermented seafood, and this is a kind of shrimp down here. And then you have tuna. This is all the fermented things. It changes herring and so on. Uh, fresh, so fresh seafood. I don't even know what that is. Uh, processed products, sea urchin. But you didn't know about that one. Sea urchin is one of the highest, and that's into the thousand. That's how high the purines are there. And anchovies, so dried anchovies were the highest of all of these. So the dried anchovies comes on your Caesar salad, remember? Okay, but the story of purine food sources has changed drastically in the past 70 years. Here's why. Sugars have completely changed in nature and in volume. I'm not gonna go long on this. And so gout occurrence in the US has risen in line with fructose consumption, other in line with other things too, I'll show you, since the 1970s. Pretty much part and parcel what I, that New York Times article. So here you have the high fructose corn syrup coming online, and there you have the prevalence of gout. So yeah, there is a, an association, but some will even say it's a correlation, but let's add to that. Fats have changed in terms of type and volumes consumed. What do we mean? Here's the data. And this is from uh, Dr. Uh, Artemis Anopoulos. And so here we got, basically, let's look at the 50s to the present. We see omega-6 has increased, omega-3 has decreased, total fat has decreased, vitamin C has even decreased. And so let's go to the next one. Oils we've used in our food. What we found, if you remember back when I did the videos on those two talks, uh, Minnesota in the mid 70s and the diet heart study out of Sydney, Australia, this is the era of these two studies. And so since these two studies, which we're advocating under Ansel Keys to increase your polyunsaturated fats and decrease your saturated fats, that's when soybean oil and actually uh, corn oil zoomed up, but mostly soy soybean oil. Don't you wish you had stock in that company? <laughs> okay, but um, it was huge. So in other words, we're getting, the oils are changing completely. Now let's show how linoleic acid omega-6 has really increased from 1960 to 2008, 1961 to 2008. This is 
the amount of omega-6 fatty acid in body fat has increased by more than 200%. That's threefold in the past 50 years alone. Okay, and this is regular relative to chimpanzees and their diet hasn't changed. So it's huge, it's a big deal. It's an independent big factor, so it's not just fructose. Okay, and here is I just grabbed a sheet of the clients and patients that I work with and I do my all my labs I put them on a big spreadsheet so I get to make comparisons and so here's what I did here is that I made it I lined them all up according to their results on the omega-6-3 ratio so here is the highest ratio meaning it has the highest omega-6 and the lowest omega-3 and here I get to see how much omega-3 is there too down and so it's just that ratio I've called out for this particular comparison and what it shows all the red are out of range numbers. Just notice as we go from high to low, down here is fairly low, that um, we're losing the redness. And so if you want to say, let's, what about inflammation? Well, we have one little outlier over here, but for the most part, there's a loose correlation with the omega-6-3. So according to the New England Journal of Medicine in 1996, let's get their view, right? So this is kind of the conventional view. This was in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, what makes uric acid go up? Genetic and acquired renal acid under excretion, 90%. So this is all about genes here. Alcohol, alcohol, which actually is the number one reason for gout today, and the, the, the association with alcohol consumption and everything else, uh, increases production and decreases excretion. Obesity increases production, decreases exc excretion. I agree with that, that's true. Uh, insulin resistance. Uh, medications. Here is a whole new category that didn't exist 2,700 years ago. So let's compare. So omega-6 and omega-3 ratios. And this I actually got from Dr. Sinopoulos. It's one of her presentations of about a month ago that I was watching. And so this is a great summary. Paleolithic. This is the omega-6-3 ratio. It's under to 1 to 1. Greece prior to 1960 was between 1 and 2. Current United States is about 16. That's right up there with my labs. My lab highest was 17. England is more or less the same, 15. Japan is four. So for a modern culture still to be on average, four is incredible. That's incredible, which means a lot of people have it much better than this. Uh, India rural is five to six. India urban is up to 50. Huge. Okay, the reality of this dramatic change in, is on our dinner plate. And here's what we see. And here's the ratios, the omega-6-3 ratios of pork, as in pork chops, um, chicken breasts. And notice the difference between uh, grass-fed beef, meaning they're ranged like the good old-fashioned days, just like you saw on rawhide, and um, grain-fed, five to one, more or less. You must have an 8% omega-3 in your red blood cell percentage. That's what that number stands for. Uh, to avoid heart, heart disease. Preformed sources of EPA and particularly of DHA are required. What does preformed mean? So it means you have to eat the fish that have the EPA and the DHA. It has to be already made, you're eating it directly. So you can say, well, is that like taking a supplement? Studies are the supplements are effective. Studies are fish are also very effective as well. So you need to get it one way or the other. In other words, what it's saying is you can't get it by eating plants that have ALA. So to reach that level in the blood of EPA and DHA, ALA is poorly converted to DHA. There's two studies that go along that go into that, which I'm not gonna go into much, but I'll give you the takeaway. So here's your omega-6 pathway, and here's your omega-3 pathway, and pretty much the same railroad tracks, except the same enzymes, but a different starting point. And so what we find is this is a mutation. FADS S2, FADS S1, same thing is that not everybody, and most people actually can't, but certain cultural people, mostly those from Africa, do have both of these mutations and they can't convert ALA from plants. They can't eat plants and get their EPA and DHA. So they have to eat fish, primarily marine fish, but lake fish as well. So for instance, the trouts and so on but it's far better to have marine fish and marine food. So ALA really can't, these people cannot convert ALA to EPA. So that's the big myth about when you see your, your mayo in the grocery store, it says with ALA, it's trying to make you believe it's an omega-3. So technically you have to call alpha linolenic acid as a omega-3, but it doesn't get down to the kinds of omega-3s that you actually want. Okay, so what I did, I did spend a lot of time making this big spreadsheet of omega-6, omega-3 saturated fats 
the ratio of omega-3 to 6, and then the ratio of omega-6 and saturated fats together to get the ideal is that we know that omega-3s tend to reduce the reabsorption of uric acid, and omega-6s increase the absorption of uric acid. So therefore, and saturated fats increase the reabsorption of uric acid. So if I add omega-6 and uric acid together compared to omega-3, that should tell me something. It told me some things, it didn't tell me a lot of things. For the most part, so for instance, in beef liver, so this is just about the fats. This isn't about the purines. I'm adding a level here, just about the fats. This says that, you know, here's our ratios, and they're ho-hum. The omega-6 ratio, it's at nine for beef liver, eight for calves liver. But when you get to goose liver, it's 128. That's huge. So we already saw on the purines list that goose liver was really high in purines. Now I'm showing you not only is there is, is it really high in saturated fats, and I'm not saying bad saturated fats, I'm saying in regards to uric acid, it is saying, come on in, uric acid, come on in. And it's a huge number. So now it's the second reason why, as much as I love pagua, and unfortunately it's a bad way they raise the geese and so I don't have it anymore. But in terms of taste, to be honest, I love it. Beef kidney is 21, that's fairly high. Stomach, tripe. It's not that big of a deal. Here's sweet bread, which is thymus, pretty high. Sweet beef thymus is really pretty high, not quite as high as a goose liver. And after that, not much. All the brains, no, so it's not a fat issue, it's just a purine issue with the other organ meats. But beef liver is a superfood. This is also a three ounce, everything's a three ounce proportion, so they're apples to apples. And so now it says these are all the wonderful things in beef liver, which we've talked about many times. If you just lived on liver and egg yolks, be fine for the rest of your life. However, you do have to be careful about huge amount of vitamin A and huge amount of copper. So having, being smart, I'm talking about concentration here. I'm not talking about good food, bad food. I'm saying concentration. You can't have a lot of highly concentrated purines, but you can't have a lot of liver for other reasons as well, because you get a lot of vitamin A and copper and so on and so forth. So weekly, it's good. Daily has to be a very little amount or you'll get yourself in trouble like I have. Okay, here's about the omega-3s and 6s. The omega-3s decrease uric acid by uh, inhibiting reabsorption. Omega-6s increase uric acid by reabsorbing it. ALA is saying, so there's ALA, it's an omega-3, which is converted, as I've just shown you, to, to EPA and DHA, but these are the two you need. Many people can't convert this, so this is kind of a pointless exercise on this aspect, but you need to know your omega-3s are doubly important. So it's not just purines, it's that we've changed the whole fat situation. Then we changed the sugar situation. Okay, so omega-6 comparison of, there's the beef fed, the grass fed, and the grain fed. You got these from Artemis's uh, slide, and pork chops, hugely high. Now here's the game that I got from, all these numbers come from chronometer, by the way. And uh, I've corresponded with them this week. And they actually got back and said, yes, we double check our numbers. Okay, so here's venison, right? There's that, the rich man's meat. Okay, so the venison was 16 when I did that omega-6 plus saturated fats compared to omega-3. That's not that bad. Venison's fine. So it may be on the purine list, but it's not on the bad ratio list. Um, and here's the ratio of five. It's not that bad. It's not one to one, but it's certainly not 20. And veal is pretty much the same. Veal is a little worse in terms of the fat aspect, and both of these were on the purine list. So you start adding up these little dings, so to say. Okay, now it's poultry. There's uh, chicken. This is factory-raised chicken. The omega-6-3, as we would expect, is they're fed corn and soy, boom. By the way, what I learned in raising down here pastured free-range chickens not only do they go out and they peck and get the bugs that they want to get, and you can just leave it at that, but there are meals, meaning um, feeds you can give them, which is primarily mealworm, other bugs, and, you know, grass seeds and so on. So it's what they would be eating. You're just giving them, you know, giving them that. So what we are seeing here now, here's egg yolk to egg yolk. This is your store-bought egg yolks. And here's what we have is omega-6-3 ratio. We knew that was high. That's it's funny. That comes right off the same number as my uh, patients and clients. And it's a pretty high omega-6 plus saturated fats compared to omega-3 number, pretty high. But when you look at egg yolk, that is a one-to-one -one ratio, the cretion, right, from Crete, as Dr. Sinopoulos talks about, that's actually pretty wonderful, which, again, brings you back to pastured-free range or 
Cretion, um, egg yolks are just wonderful, along with liver. They probably have great liver too. Again, everything's three ounces. I'm not going to go through everything, but let's go to anchovy since we've heard so much about them that they're not a big deal when it comes to how egregious could they possibly be. The ratio is, yeah, they have uh, more omega-3 than omega-6 and some saturated fats, but it's mostly purines with anchovies. It's not a fat story. So on none of these, is it really a fat story? None of the seafood is a fat story. Okay, so omega-6 to 3 ratio, polyunsaturated fats in the diet has changed so much that some cultures are becoming extinct. What do I mean by that? So this was 2016. This is a global survey of omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA in the bloodstream of healthy adults. And what we see is, so green, to orient you, green is over 8%. So that's, they're at that level in their blood, red blood cell fat percent or better. So it's funny, Alaska is separate from the United States. Good for them. Um, there's all that Alaskan wild salmon, no doubt that they actually eat, eat it there. Uh, Greenland and Norway. So if you notice, the only Western country that has sufficient levels of omega-3 is really Norway. You could say Greenland too. I don't put them in the same category. And then we have, there's Papua New Guinea over here. But the big loss here, if we were to measure all of Oceania, and uh, we talked about Ta the Taiwanese, we talked about the uh, Maori, the Maori of New, New, uh, New Zealand, that how they have the highest rates of gout in the world, this would be one of the contributing factors. So by fat alone, we have severely changed. So all the Inuits are up here. All the Inuits that are up here are toast. We've basically exterminated their culture, made them very sick. Um, that's not to measure, not to mention things about heavy metals and so on and so forth that have also shown up into the into their food system, unfortunately. Okay, it has been shown that high omega-3 and high omega-3 to 6 ratio, meaning high omega-3 leads to reduced risk of subsequent gout attacks, also less cardiovascular. Neutral is no impact at all. Low omega-3, high omega-6 increases it. What we've seen, now we've seen it around the world, you can now point to the fat as almost an equal culprit right up there with purines. So when I say, don't make purines the death of you, expand your mind and include in other things as well. And remember, it's a concentration story. It's not bad food. It's like, I love it, but have a little bit less. I mostly love liver but I can't have it that much for these reasons. Okay, comparison of nutrient compositions between unprocessed processed foods and the diet of Crete. And you wonder where I got this from? You bet. So for instance, it's a great culture that hasn't changed that much. Thank goodness. Omega-6 in ultra processed foods, high. Crete, low. Omega-3s, low in process, ultra processed foods, high. Uh, you also can go into protein and so on and so forth, but this is a big deal. Purines are important, but other factors are as important or even more important. You can change it back for yourself by doing these things. That's why I'm pointing out. That's why I'm talking about this. I say that's a good place to start. Till next time. So if this is the kind of video that you like, that we go deeper into a smaller area that has a lot of relevance to a particular population, let me know. Because my way is going, what are the labs about? What's the research about? Let's be real. It's just not hypothetical. It's not like, oh, I've read 10 different abstracts and therefore this is the conclusion. I take that idea and let's look at the labs. Do the labs tell the story that we have just learned about in these particular studies? If they do, that's a home run. If not, then it's too esoteric. But let me know if this is something you're interested in. Thanks.